Hi, this week I'm here with Michelle from NIL Network. She is um, actually a, a former volleyball, sand volleyball player, correct? Or volleyball player? Um, I grew up playing both uh, in college. Beach volleyball, unfortunately, wasn't a sport yet. So I went the indoor route and then ended up coaching collegiately on the beach volleyball side because that was really my number one love. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so what made you get interested in all the NFL NIL information and what, what are you doing? What, what are you doing with that information? How are you helping people in the community? Because yeah, so, so I've worked around the uh, collegiate space. I mean, if I counted from being a player into coaching and a bit on the admin side for around 15 years now, and um, what really struck me was in 2019 when, when California passed SB 206, which would permit their collegiate athletes within the state to monetize their NIL. Starting, I think they, they passed it in 2019 with a start date, I think of the original one was January, 2023. So giving some time for everyone else to catch up and for the NCAA to make some changes. Um, and I was just absolutely fascinated with this change because it is a massive change to the whole collegiate sports model, something that is long overdue, but something I never anticipated really coming from the, the state level. Um, we're always hoping that NCAA can be a bit more progressive and pass their own things, but I think the, the states have had enough. So um, really dove into the topic, uh, started NIL Network as a place to share resources and try to bring a little bit more clarity to the space for coaches, athletes, and administrators. Um, just because I felt, you know, with COVID last year, not enough people were talking about this. And it was something that the deadlines were coming in 2021. And, you know, now we're sitting here in September and here we are two and a half months in. I know I was so excited when it passed, but I remember my husband um, was coaching at USC at the time. And so I talked to the guy that was, um, he was actually the inter interim AD at the time, but he's also an attorney and real smart guy. And he goes, uh, I said, oh, what do you think is going to happen? He goes, I have no idea. He was like, he goes, I said, well, what's the NCAA going to do? They're going to have to make some rules. And he goes, yeah, we're talking about it. I don't know what they're going to do. Then fast forward, you know, and I'm following everything, following everything, just like you. And so I called Senator Skinner's office and I met with the guy who helped create the bill. And the reason why she created it was... <laughs> When she was in college at Berkeley, um, she had seen the two track athletes from S San Jose State. They spoke at her university mm -hmm. about what had happened to them when they, you know, put their fists up, you know, during the, the Olympics. And she always thought that everything that was going on with student athletes was unfair. And so she started just talking about this with the other people in the, in the you know, the Congress, Senate, you know, state, state Senate, obviously. And um, she found out that it, it, a lot of them were like, oh, I don't think that's going to pass. Come to find out it, she proposed it and both sides agreed. And I was, cause I thought it was maybe because of the O'Bannon case. I don't know if you've read this book, Court of Justice, but it's, a, no. you should read it. It's about, the reason why we're really here is because of that O'Bannon, because he's the one who sued the NCAA and Michael McCann was the attorney who's also a professor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, be, he sued the NCAA NEA sports because they were using all the student athletes name, image and likeness in their game. Yeah. And the only people getting paid was the schools. And this is really why we are where we are right now. I thought she passed it because of the O'Bannon case because he ultimately wins the case at the appellate level. Then the Austin case comes down, that's unanimous. And, you know, basically, thanks to Senate Barbara Skinner, thanks to her, this made the whole country shift and completely change all the rules. Because I've always thought, wait, right to publicity? You can't just interfere with the right to publicity with people. That's not okay, right? That's completely violates the, the constitution. Right, yeah. And the fact that, you know, student athletes I mean, I guess even the collegiate level, and then also now we're looking at a little bit more at the high school level as well, are really the only people in the whole country that don't have their rights to publicity. And yeah. I think if you even look at it, like I come from more of the niche sport background with beach volleyball, um, smaller sports, female sports, and, you know, um, you look at it from both sides with the revenue generating sports, football, men's basketball, who are generating hundreds of millions of dollars for their institutions in the NCAA and have huge celebrity for them not to be able to take advantage of that when most of them are not going on to have professional careers after 
is wrong. And then if you look at it from the niche sport perspective, where um, if kids are in, let's say, a class and they're sitting next to a student who's not an athlete, they both have the same kind of following on social media. This athlete next to them is making a couple hundred dollars off of endorsements a month. So not life changing money, but a little extra spending money, which is nice for athletes, whereas that athlete is um, prohibited from doing that. So I think on both sides of the spectrum, it's just something that really needed to change. So I'm happy, happy we finally got here. And it's been rushed since, you know, the past yeah. now we're two years past California passing that that bill and this past six months, man, it's just been crazy. <laughs> Yeah, so so you have what you have a website, you have obviously stuff on social media. Um, and what 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 do you think? What is the goal of what you're doing? Who are you trying to help? Mostly I want to put just a little bit more structure around this wild, wild west type industry that we're in right now. I think it's a pretty rare circumstance that a new industry pops up and it's already projected to be a billion dollar industry in the next couple of years, which is a it's super exciting, but it also on the flip side of it, it's a little bit just scary because there are a lot of, you know, different people that are coming to the space, different companies, and how can we put a little bit more just structure around it and a little bit more clarity around who's doing fantastic work in this industry and how can we lift those people up and versus, yeah. you know, some other, other types. So really my, my main offering um, or one of the main offerings that I'm getting to in time is uh, trying to build a, a rate and review directory of all the different services and companies within the space where athletes, if it's like a, a B2C type company, athletes can go on and, and leave their reviews if they worked with a great, you know, marketing agent or whatnot and want to lift that person up um, in the B2B space for athletic departments. We know, you know, the early leaders being influencer and open doors, um, Altius, some other ones. But there's a lot out there that I think are doing pretty good work as well that can provide some of those resources to um, college athletic departments. But if I were a athletic director who tomorrow got a budget for, let's say, $50,000 to invest in some NIL resources, where would I even start to look to spend that money? Like they are, there's just not a lot. There's, there's a lot out there, but there's not a lot that's organized in a uh, kind of like a digestible way. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And I think from my perspective, because I've been representing, oh, you know, professional athletes in the NIL space, not, not, it wasn't called NIL, it was endorsement deals, and then negotiating their employment contracts. And there's really a lot that can go wrong. Um, and what I mean by that is a brand can take advantage of a student athlete. Um, when you do allow a company to use your name and likeness, this is my message to students is you need to know how your name's being used. You need to know how long it's being used. And you need to have an attorney look over the words in the deal, because as you and I know, in studying some of the deals, some of the deals have not been very fair to student athletes. Um, we talked about the one gaming deal where they were basically the student athletes who signed up for very little money uh, had given away everything to this gaming company, like for the rest of their life. And Which is interesting in itself because with the NCAA interim policy that says they can't be signing any deals that extend beyond their athletic eligibility, it's like that you can't even really put that into a contract without breaking the, the, the rules of the game. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing here is then can a, an athletics department say, you know what, that deal is not acceptable and then is it null and void? Because some of the state law does kind of address that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I think that we're seeing a little bit of that um, in terms of the, the bar stool situation with a couple of thousand bar. athletes. And it's interesting because a couple of universities come out and said, you know, you're not permitted to be a bar stool athlete. But some of them are citing like they're, you know, that they're owned, partially owned by a pen um, gambling. But the yeah. other ones, you know, when July, the first week of July, when Barstool was posting all of those athletes out on their Instagram, almost all of them were in their school uniforms with the, the intellectual property of the university. And that was like, I know that a lot of universities went their athletes and said, you have to have Barstool take that down. Like we ourselves do not, you cannot just use our logos, our intellectual property without getting, getting written permission without even potentially a licensing fee. I think some of the schools have out now. So um, that was another kind of red flag around that. And I was actually just on their Instagram account the other day 
there's still a lot of athletes out there with the logo of the school. And I know in the Barstool contract, they click the box, it says, I have the rights to use this photo, but do athletes really understand what that actually means? And that potentially well, with the marks on it, do they? Well, if you take a picture of yourself and you own the picture, okay? Like in the state of California, the state statute specifically says that a student can identify as a, like as a football player at UCLA or USC or whatever. Mm -hmm. What they can't do is they can't use the marks because that's a trademark violation. Okay. So now really a school could sue Barstool Sports and the student athlete, <laughs> which is, yeah. you know, which I know is, and guess what? Barstool Sports is just giving them a t-shirt. They're not even giving them money. So my whole thing with the whole, with that whole Barstool Sports thing, okay, there are 36, I think 36% owned by a gambling company, which is a problem. One school told me I'm okay with it because they're not, pr they're not promoting the gambling company. They're promoting Barstool Sports. Then look at the kind of stuff Barstool Sports says and does. Eh, you really want to align your brand with them? Yeah. <laughs> you see exactly. what I mean? the, the problem I have with Barstool Sports is they are just a little too, they just will say anything and do anything. And it yeah. that is hurtful to other people, and that's not okay, right? Yeah, um, and that's exactly like a, a university's worst nightmare. Essentially, is like this brand that they've built, their their logo, the the prestige of a university going back, you know, to whatever time, and then all of a sudden they have this association through one of their athletes with a company that doesn't stand for those same kind of values. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just that education piece for the athletes to understand that it's, yeah. it's a business and it's, they're dealing with real life issues now, real life contracts. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Which is why they need an attorney. Hello. That's why I'm like, no, you need, <laughs> cause this is what's really odd. Anybody can actually represent people in the NIL space as long as they're registered with the state and registered at the compliance department. That's what the rules are, okay, in the state where they're operating. So if you're going after a student athlete in, let's say, Tennessee, you've got to be registered in their state and you've got to be registered at the school. Um, and they make you fill out paperwork. But there's no educational re requirement for a lot of the states. Uh, <laughs> so it's a little scary. It's a little scary, but I'm saying to student athletes, you really should hire an attorney, not somebody who's a not attorney or somebody in their, in their business that has an attorney that works for them, either one, because they're, these contracts are contracts. They're legal contracts. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's why I also think that like the, the rate and review directory where potentially you know, someone like yourself could be listed with how many years you've been in the industry and like these other types of things that um, can like lift up the people who are doing really good professional work. And I just, yeah, it's, it's a very, very, very hard time. You know, 18, 19, 22 year old kids who are not again signing, most of them are not signing these deals that extend much beyond a couple hundred dollars or even potentially just merchandise. And it's, you know, cost prohibitive for them to go out and hire an attorney to review something for like a $20 contract. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's why, I mean, I charge a percent for these NIL deals. That's just how if I get you a deal. That's, I, I get a percentage of that. And that's just how you'd have to do it. I wish I could do more of a flat fee model, but I don't, it, they, they wouldn't have the money to do it. No. So it's, it's a real catch 22. I think it's also a catch 22 that the universities can't assist in any way. Because they could have somebody inside just to review, you know, smaller deals, yeah. right? Because I think most of the deals, honestly, aren't that big. They, they, they aren't that much money. There's a few that are really big deals, but very few, right? Like you heard about the, like the, the quarterback at, you know, Ohio State who hadn't even snapped a ball yet, got a really big deal. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I think those guys are going to be fine. They're going to build out, they're going to have their team around them and, and plenty of people who are going to help them in all aspects. It's really the, the other, let's see, there's about 500,000 NCAA athletes. So the other 480,000. <laughs> so I really think women are going to do well in this space. I think volleyball is such a great sport because people really love sand volleyball. 
Yeah. It's a big sport and it's international. I mean, yeah, and especially, I mean, it's kind of good timing coming off of the Olympic year, even if the Olympics were delayed um, by a year. And from the volleyball side, winning the gold medal in women's beach volleyball, women's indoor and women's sitting volleyball, I think only lifts kind of the, the, the um, visibility of the sport moving forward. And that's typically where we see the spikes in popularity of volleyball are always after the Olympic year. And that's when a lot of the brands uh, that want to get involved with volleyball players. So even coming off of Open Doors, is, um, I think two year statistics in volleyball was behind football. Football is yeah. you know, still leading the way. I think they're about 70 or 80% of the deals signed, but volleyball was second with about 10% and then followed by men's basketball. Um, so happy to see that as a volleyball athlete. Yeah, <laughs> I, know. I guess that is great. What position did you play in volleyball? Libro. Ah, gotcha. I was a setter. Oh, nice. I yeah, I didn't play in college, but I, I, I loved being the setter. Yeah, you know, you always got to touch sport. the ball, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so is there anything else like how, okay, what are your social handles where somebody can follow um, all of the stuff you have going on in the resources? Yep. Um, I am primarily active on Instagram and so that's just at NIL network. Um, I have a Twitter account to be honest. So I I am not much into Twitter. I'm getting a little bit more as I understand that's where a majority of college sports conversations are taking place. Um, so yeah, on Instagram and Twitter, it's just at uh, NIL Network and my website is nilnetwork.com. Um, I have a newsletter I send out once a month. It's just kind of the trends report of the month, everything to be aware of, and then moving kind of forward predictions for where we're going. Um, so that's a good one as well. Oh, so how does somebody get your newsletter? We can put that in the show notes too of the podcast. Yeah, so either through um, my LinkedIn bio on the Instagram account, there's a sign up there. Or if you go on my website, I think there's a little pop-up that asks if you want to register. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, it was great to have you on my podcast. Is there any uh, anything else you want to share with anybody out there that we haven't talked about? Um, I would just say for any athletes listening, I, I, I feel that they're especially coming out the gates that there was a ton of FOMO around like, oh, my teammates doing this, or I see this athlete doing this and wanting to jump into all of these deals. And really NIL is here to stay forever. Find the right deal that matches with you as a person, your brand and somebody that 10 years from now, you're going to be proud to, to represent that company and to promo it out there. It's, you know, it's nothing that you need to just feel like you have to do every single deal that comes your way and you don't want to make yourself a walking billboard. So be selective, read the contracts and uh, enjoy the process. It's a fun time to be a college athlete. I know. Don't you feel like they're so lucky? I, I do. Yeah. But <laughs> it's also adding another thing to their, you know, already just so busy plate of being a full-time student, being a full-time athlete. And now, especially I think on the female athlete side, they just like they're a little weary to jump into because they're like, I, I just, I don't know what this is going to look like in, time, in terms of my time management and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I mean, you have to be careful. And I know there have been student athletes that in talking to some athletic administrators where they, they did take on too many brands, some real, some people have really big followings and are very successful and they took on too many brands at one time and got really overwhelmed. So you do want to be careful about that. That's is why you need some guidance and yeah, don't rush into it. I think that's really good advice. I also want to just share with my audience that, um, I do have a, a free class on, what you have to do before you get involved in NIL representation. And that is going to be in my IG bio. You can click on that particular link and get that free class. And then in October, I'm going to have a workshop. This, this workshop will not be free. <laughs> it is a, a paid workshop. And that will be one to help sports agents who are just getting into the NIL space. This is how you can do it. Okay. How to get do it. And it also will be for student athletes. This is how to get started. If you're going to represent yourself, here's what you need to do. So that will be coming up in October. And um, if you do want representation, um, I formed another company called NIL Image Makers just for the purpose of representing college athletes in the NIL space. So um, you can get in touch with me, um, either my Instagram 
which is at Jill Baxter, um, at Agent Jill Baxter. And um, I'm also on Twitter and I have a website, jillmcbridebaxter.com. We also have handles under NIL Image Makers, but um, I think we have a lot more information on the other uh, Instagram and Twitter handles. So anyways, uh, get a hold of me if you're wanting to get into representing athletes in the NIL space, or if you're an athlete just wondering, what should I do? So thanks for being on my show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jill. Always fun to chat NIL. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just got to stop the recording. <laughs>